The second objective of the lesson is to recognise some of the sources of English law. This side, which is titled Sources of English Law, is basically a timeline that shows the invasion of England at 1066 and goes right up to modern times. At the beginning, after the William the Conqueror uh, successfully captured the whole of England, the source of law was royal decree. In other words, what William Conqueror said was law. But in the background, there was what we call the common law. And that is what was common in law to the entire country. Later on, about Henry II's time now, if you're an historian, things like precedent and case law and equity began to develop so that there was royal decree, common law, then case law and equity together developing to provide law and answers to common issues such as whether someone's broken their contract or whether uh, a trust should be upheld or whether a will should be upheld. Also, as Parliament became more powerful, legislation would be passed and that is the next development after case law and equity legislation and we will discuss legislation later which comes from Parliament but it also comes from local bylaws and things like that. There is also international law that still exists that would still have to comply with because we've signed treaties and that's not just European law and while European law has gone in relation to the EU being the sovereign and in relation to EU law as regarding European Court of Justice being superior to the English courts while that has gone in principle, in practice, the, all the courts and all the law of European law is still inside and still practiced as a source of law in this country. In fact, they actually passed a piece of legislation to confirm that. And then there's other international law that is nothing to do with the European um, Union, such as the human rights, uh, which comes from the uh, Council of Europe, which is a totally different organisation, or the Decor European Declaration on Human Rights, the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, there are trade pacts, there are packs in relation to climate, there's lots of international law. So just giving you a quick overview of what we're going to discuss in the next part of the lecture, step by step, and we're going to do it logically, starting off with royal decrees.
This is about royal proclamation, the power of the king to, or queen, to effectively assert what they say the law is through a royal proclamation. Uh, they announce a law and the law exists and all the king or queen subjects obey the law or face the penalties for not obeying the law. That's what we mean by royal proclamation. Royal proclamation doesn't exist as such, but there are some royal prerogatives that still exist to this day, such as promulgation, uh, which is opening and closing Parliament. Now, the Queen usually does that, well, nearly always does that with the advice of her ministers um, but uh, in a recent case she was given wrong advice and the courts had to step in and say that the um, power was misused by the prime minister and his ministers other remaining residual crown powers include patronage having the right to make lords ladies um, give awards that sort of thing This slide is about common law. The origins of common law are through custom. Different areas of the, of the country, like England and Wales and other countries we're talking about at the moment, have different customs. It may be, for example, that fishing rights on rivers and things like that may be granted through custom because it's always been that way what is common custom throughout the land is what was seen as the common law of england and wales in the past and that's how it became to be named the common law for example it was the common law that you would be judged by a jury of your peers, people the same as you from the same location, would judge your behaviour. That's an example. Some examples still exist of the common law, uh, which carry on to this day, such as the crime of murder breach of the peace, some contract law, they all still exist. This, this side shows the position in the medieval period where the common law was established. But the, it was very important in relation to in civil matters, such as contract law, buying and selling, auctions, making apprenticeships, commerce, those sorts of things. In the 
criminal matters, then practices such as this one shows trial by combat, the criminal processes, trial with a jury, all stemmed from the common law. And that is where the origins came from. Most of the common law has been altered, changed or adapted or codified, which is put in writing and put through what we call a piece of legislation. But not all. There are still some common law offences, such as murder, conspiracy to defraud, breach of the peace or misconduct in public office. In civil side, contract law, where it's not been codified, I put in legislation, still exists and forms part of the common law and is interpreted in case law. Some of the principles in relation to civil wrongs, which are called torts, such as nuisance, trespass and negligence, also stem from the common law and are still practised in the courts. So the common law, although it's been adapted and changed and is not as important as it was, still exists and it's still a source of English law. We finished discussing common law, but there's another form of law which was created around about the same time, and it's the law of equity. So let me tell you the story. The king delegated a lot of his legal responsibilities to the Lord Chancellor, who was his chief advisor. It was said that the Lord Chancellor would have the ear of the King. And rather than trying to get the King to hear a case personally, they were um, petitioners would approach the Lord Chancellor and ask him to intervene. At this time, women and children could not hold property and were considered to need protection by a male relative. So in the event a woman became a widow, when her husband died, the will would appoint a trustee to look after the property. Someone to be trusted was a trustee. But what happens if that person who was to look after the property and be the guardian of the woman and her children took the money for themselves or took the land or the property? Well, let's start with a simple story here that I've illustrated. Once upon a time, a lord went to war, leaving his wife and children. Well, let's start with a 
simple story here that I've illustrated. Once upon a time, a lord went to war, leaving his wife and children. Before leaving, being a wise person, he wrote a document or had a document written for him, which is a trust document and a last will and testament, where he entrusted his wife and his children in the event of his death to his brother to look after them and, and the, his assets for the benefit of his family. His brother didn't look after the property, took the property and treated the wife and children badly. Now the king's law or the common law said that the property didn't or couldn't belong to a woman and children. So there was no what lawyers call remedy. But the family petitioned the Lord Chancellor who was propel, prepared to use his power to compel this nasty man here into honouring his duties under the trust document. And if he didn't, he'd go to prison. And he'd be kept there until he did. What we would call in nowadays an injunction with the threat of imprisonment. So a court of chancery developed with a parallel law running parallel to the common law which is called equity and it was in the court of chancery which is from chancellors it became <laughs> and you, Sing Charles, what is your view? Well, I think it is mine, and I'm sure I'll... Well, we'll have to make a decision soon. I decided sheep stealers should hang. Well, I really, I make them pay a fine. Hanging's a bit tough. I do whip them, though. Well, up north, we chop their hands off. Well, we need to decide a common position. So, after that little bit of play acting, the need for a common position was how case law developed. They couldn't have a situation where different areas had different actions or results from the same sort of case. 
so they started to write down their cases and the judges who did circuits wrote down their decisions and tried to be consistent with each other and it's these decisions that were later relied on by lawyers to say well hang on in the case of which whatever the name of the case was the previous case the decision or the ruling was this why is it different now and that's how case law began the circuit judges would go from town to town in their circuit and hold courts and criminal cases would be for the most serious cases would be set aside for them to hear and other cases which were uh, too big for the local magistrates to decide and things involving some civil law were also set aside for them so they'd go on this circuit make the decisions and then leave and go to another location and complete that circuit and then get back to London with all their decisions written down A new industry started gradually where court reports were written into books and on this side you can see an example of different types of books that are printed by different organisations all containing case law. You can still get weekly law reports or uh, all England law reports and as you can see I've given you examples of what they look like when they're abbreviated after a case name so you often see what is lawyers call the citation after a case name and year here's an example of one Blackburn v Attorney General 1971 and the citation is two so it's the second book of that year all England reports at 1380 so that's page one uh, that's the point 1380 in the page numbers this means volume 2 law reports at page 1380 so the lawyers can find the decision quickly and each citation is slightly different what makes up case law includes when judges interpret what words mean in legislation written by parliament or they may be deciding directly on a new point of law from a more junior court so they've got power to make or change that decision because there is more senior court or it could be case law about supervising government secondary legislation this is normally called judicial review so all these things are case law
I'm going to look at the example of Blackburn and the Attorney General um, because it's a good example of, of how case law works and the supremacy of Parliament and how adaptable lawyers have to be and judges are in relation to deciding cases. The case itself involved a early decision about the common market, what we now know to be the European Union. The dis case was about um, who was small superior because previously in English law, Parliament was the supreme lawmaker. But the EU required that EU law should be judged by the European Court of Justice. And that appeared to conflict with the idea that Parliament is sovereign, is the most powerful lawmaking body. So Lord Denning craftily said, well, hang on, the decision is and always has to be an English court that Parliament is supreme. But in this case, Parliament has made a piece of legislation which says that for that period, European law will be deemed to be superior and referred to the European courts when Parliament says so. So that meant that Parliament retained the sovereignty and the right to put a new piece of legislation in to say not anymore. And that's exactly what happened when we left the European Union. It was simply the case that, that Parliament had to put an act of Parliament into effect, changing its mind. But, and because Parliament is always superior, that's what was done. So what has this to do with the interpretation of case law? Well, it shows that case law can be judge-made law and it's very subtle into parts. The case report itself will contain two separate parts, which may not be clear to a non-lawyer. The reasons for the decision are referred to by the Latin title ratio decidendi, and the things said by the way, obiter dicta, are other parts of the judgment that don't relate to the particular case and the particular decision. They're merely what judges would call persuasive. It is the part of the case that is the ratio decidendi, the reasons for the decision, which is binding on the junior courts. So lawyers have to identify which part is which when they interpret case law. Now I've given a link for this particular case on the slide. We have just explained that uh, the lower courts have to follow the decision of the higher courts. So you need to know the courts. Um, in the civil case, it's the county court is the lowest in the pyramid, then the high court, then the court of appeal, and then the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court, if it makes a decision, 
then that decision has to be followed by all the lower courts in its ratio decedendi, the reasons for the decision. Only the Supreme Court in those circumstances could change its mind in a, the, a future decision. So the county court would have to follow all the courts above it, like the High Court and the Court of Appeal, and the High Court would have to follow the Courts of Appeal decisions, and the Court of Appeal would have to follow the Supreme Court's decisions. So you can see the pyramid effect and how precedence works. There is a slight exception in relation to human rights that it goes up in the same way to the court system, but there's another route of appeal if against the Supreme Court decision, and that is to the European Court of Human Rights, which is superior in relation to human rights law. But that's unusual. We have just explained that uh, the lower courts have to follow the decision of the higher courts. Precedence works in a similar way, well, identical way, in relation to the criminal court. So the who's supreme to who matters in the criminal court. So at the bottom, we have magistrates, court, which includes youth courts, the crown court, then the court of appeal for criminal courts, and the supreme court at the head of of the more. So the rule of precedence in case law would mean that the Crown Court would have to follow the decisions of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court and the Magistrates Court would have to follow all the courts above it. Uh, so in exactly the same way as in within the civil process. An interesting example of how the Supreme Court changed a previous decision and the effect of that was the RVR, which was in 1991. R, the first case is up means Regina because in all criminal cases, the cases brought by the Crown, 
in this Regina or Rex if it's a king and it's against that individual who was n named only as R because it the case involved uh, an allegation of rape well in this case in 1991 the case had been that a man who committed an act of rape against his wife could not be prosecuted from a previous case many years before and it was always the case that that was true up till 1991 fortunately in 1991 the case was appealed uh, and went from the Crown Court to the Court of Appeal and then to the Supreme Court who decided to ignore their previous decision when it was the House of Lords a long time ago obviously not the same judges and decide that a husband could rape his wife that was law changed through case law in the criminal courts and that's why it's a good example of changing attitudes and behavior and the case law and the rules of precedence allowing for people to change their minds through time the next source of english law is legislation England and Wales is governed by Parliament and the Crown is the government embodied so when we say the Crown or the Sovereign or the Houses of Commons and the Houses of House of Lords what do we actually mean well Parliament is made up of the House of Commons and the House of Lords to, if, with the Queen as well as those three bodies the government is called the Crown and it's the combination of the three which is sovereign over all other forms of law what does that mean well it means that if an act of parliament says one thing and a contract or another law says something different then the most recent act of parliament is the one that matters and ca you cannot change the law because you don't like it even if you write a new term in your contract of employment or whatever you, in other words what Parliament says stands and it's superior to what anyone else says so let's just summarize where we're up to the crown or the sovereign power is the House of Commons the House of Lords and the Queen together but the main power is contained in the house of commons let me explain this is the house of commons on the one side sits the government on the other side sits the opposition the leader of the government is the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition is the leader of the opposition the speaker sits here and 
the prime minister is someone who can secure a majority in the House of Commons. The prime minister has to appoint his cabinet and The cabinet is made up of members of the House of Commons or peers coming from the House of Lords. In this case, we've got a picture of the cabinet. And the Prime Minister, in this case Boris, is normally the leader of the majority in the House of Commons. And he chooses ministers from MPs and members of the House of Lords. Because the Prime Minister has a majority in the House of Commons, he can pass legislation, such as Bills put before Parliament which become acts or as pieces of legislation once they've been approved by Parliament as a whole, that's the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and the Queen then signs it to give royal assent. That's how a piece of legislation comes into existence. But the main power in Parliament is the House of Commons. Here we have an emblem that you will probably be familiar with. This is the Royal Coat of Arms. And it's used by the government and it's used in government buildings. For example, in the Magistrates Court and the Crown Court, you will see the coat of arms behind the judges because basically they're saying they speak for the government. And you will see this coat of arms on official documentation from the government as well. It's their symbol of the crown or the power of the government. It's also displayed on pieces of legislation to show that there are acts of parliament. 